you guys don't know me, I'm Sharon. I'm one of the worship leaders here. We are so excited to have you join us this morning. If you'll go ahead and stand and join us in worship.
Amen, church. God good or what? Amen. Hey, look, y'all stay standing with me this morning. I know it's, you're like, wait a minute, what are you doing? Listen, just stay standing with me. This is going to be quick. We're so glad you guys are here with us this morning. Are you excited to be in the house today, church? Guys, we'll do something special. We're so glad you guys to be a part of it. Can we give it up for our online campus as well? Listen, we're so glad you guys are watching. We cannot wait for you to come hang out with us. Listen, sometime today, if you would, just take a moment. You know here at Foothills, one of the things that we love and, and we strive for is connection. We want to be connected to our people and our people connected to the church. So if you would, sometime during the service or following the service or even when you get home this afternoon, go to foothills.cc slash connect. Fill that online connection card for us. Let us know how we can be there for you. If you need a pastor to call you, if you uh, need prayer, list that on there as well. If you want to take your next steps, all that is there for you guys to be able to let us know. Take advantage of that. Take that opportunity. And if you're a first-time guest with us today, can we give it up for our first-time guests in the house this morning? We're so honored that you guys are here. We cannot wait for you to experience what God's going to do, and I would love to invite you to our guest room following the service this morning. If you, it's just right outside in the, in the concourse, and when you walk out the doors, turn left, it'll be the last room on your left. We've got a free gift for you there, some staff, some other volunteers just want to talk with you, meet you, greet you, and also give you a free gift. We've got a free gift for you that we would love for you guys to have as well. Now, I got two announcements for you today, okay? You ready? Obviously, you know that today, it's November the 1st. Our next opportunity for you to go into our next class is today at 1230. You guys have heard about this the last couple of weeks. You still have time. If you're sitting here like, man, I wish I would have registered. You can do that. Follow the service. Go to our Connection Center in the, in the concourse. You can be there. Follow our second service. We've got lunch provided for you, child care as well. And you get to hear so much about the church of how you can get connected. Love for you guys to be there. You still have that opportunity. You don't have to wait till next time. Next time can be today. And then next Sunday, church, listen, Baptism Sunday. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm ready to celebrate. We've seen life change take place. God is working. God is moving. If that is you and you're ready to take your next steps, you can go to Connection Center. You can go online, get that taken care of. Love for you to be able to celebrate that with you. And then today, in just a few short moments, we're going to have our parent-child dedication. It's going to be a special moment uh, that God is going to do. Uh, here in this service. Church, uh, you know every week we talk about our giving and there's three ways that you guys can give. You can give online at foothills.cc slash give. You can give in our giving boxes in our entry and exit ways or you can continue to mail those in at PO Box 1085. But let me tell you what a difference your generosity makes. I don't know about you, but I was here last night. I was here for our trunk or treat last night, and let me tell you, they were thousands of people that came through our parking lot. It was crazy to see the traffic on the road. It was crazy. But I, as I was talking, me, uh, me and Pastor Greg kind of talked a lot during the night, and I looked at him and I said, Pastor, there is so much joy that is passing by us right now. People were saying thank you. People were smiling. They, we don't know what they came into our parking lot with, but we know what they left with. And they left with a little sight of who Jesus is based on your generosity and based on your uh, thoughtfulness and coming and helping us. So church, thank you for allowing God to use you to help someone find and follow him. It was such an exciting time. Such an exciting time. And your generosity made that happen. So church, as we get prepared to, to give back to the Father and also to continue to worship this morning and, and to experience this parent-child dedication, just prepare your hearts for what God's going to do. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to, to be used by you. God, thank you for choosing us. God, I praise you for what you did last night. I'm praising you for what you're going to do in this room this morning. Father, I pray that you will take our tithes and our offers, God, that you will use those, that you will multiply them, Father, to expand your kingdom, to expand the work that you've called us to do. But, Father, right here, right now, I pray just as you bless us, Lord, I pray that our worship will bless you. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's worship together. Peace, Lord, we 
sing out, Lord bless you. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord turn his face toward you. Uh, always, y'all can be seated. But this is always um, one of my favorite services we do because our parent child dedications are amazingly important. It's not just a ritual we go through. We believe in the family. We believe that God uh, gives us responsibility as parents. And we don't just call it a baby dedication because it's more than that, it's, it's more than the baby. It's more than the child. It's a parent-child dedication. The parents are making a commitment, as you're going to see in just a second. So if we can bring the parents and the children up, we're going to try to do this socially distanced. So that's a little different. Normally we do this on Mother's Day every year, but obviously for COVID reasons, so we couldn't do that this year. And so we have delayed it till here today, November 1st. We'll planning on doing another one on Mother's this upcoming Mother's Day. Why don't we keep going across here a little bit further? Yeah, can we watch the cord there? Let's give everybody room so we can get everybody in the light. A little further down here. Are we good? A little further, a little further, yeah? So everybody? Yeah, that's good. I love it because uh, these parents are going to be making a commitment to not only God, but to their church family. And we're going to be a part of it as well because we're going to vow to help them and if they need our assistance to be praying for them to, to say hey guys we believe in you and and this responsibility that God's given you and so this is a sacred moment really because raising children in this world that we live in is difficult but we all know that and they're going to need all the help that they can get in order to really live the life that God wants them to and with these parents who are saying, man, we are gonna raise our children in a home that honors Jesus. We're gonna do the best we can to raise them in a way that they one day, but they'll make a decision to follow Jesus themselves. And then us as a church family saying, we believe in you and we, we will be praying for you and we're going to do anything we can do to help you succeed in those goals because we're a family and that's what families do. And so I've got a little bit of a commitment statement that I'm going to read to the parents and 
before I do that, I want to introduce them to you. So we'll start, I guess we'll start down here, okay? And we've got the card, all right? Up first, we have Brandon and Bryson Mitchell, and they've got their son, Benson Mitchell, who is one year old, to be dedicated today. Thank you for that. Up next, we've got Tracy Frankham, and she's got Alex Frankham, who is up next, and he's two years old. How you doing, Alex? <laughs> up next, I'm hoping, oh boy, I know I'm blocking when I do this, but up next, I think you guys recognize Brandon and Mary, they serve on our worship team. Brandon and Mary Jen Cowie. And little Logan is up this year, one, years old, one year old today. Or not today, this year. <laughs> today we're celebrating his birthday. I'm glad you guys. Up next, Tanya and Thomas Hopkins. And we've got Ashton Hopkins, who he is eight months old and has got his suspenders on. And he is ready. He's ready. I don't know if this is the youngest. I think this may be. We've got to close here. We've got next is Blaine and Elizabeth Anderson. Pastor Blaine serves on our team, and uh, he's our connections pastor. And um, he and Elizabeth have Nora, and she is three months old right now. Isn't that awesome? And I know they're excited about this. Up next, we've got John and Jessica Kinder, and they have got three children to dedicate to the Lord today. Jace who is five years old, Josiah, who is three years old, and Jane, who is one year old as well. God bless you all, thank you, isn't that awesome? And then finally, we've got Ken and Elisa Paris, and they have got Liam, who is 10 months old, to be dedicated today. Isn't it amazing to be able to be a part of something like this? So parents, I'm going to just, um, read a few things as a way of just challenging you and your role responsibility to do what you're committing to do today and that is this um, here's the here's the vow as parents we promise to take care of and raise our child or children in a god-honoring way so that hopefully one day when they're old enough that they themselves will commit their lives to jesus and become a follower of his we commit to do this doing this by praying for our child daily, teaching our child about Jesus and God's eternal principles from the Bible, by faithfully attending church with our child and modeling a Christ-like life at work, in the home, in our relationship, and as parents. And parents, if you are willing to make that commitment, I just would like you just together uh, to say, we will, or I will. Now, Church family, our part, what we get to do to invest into them. So I'm gonna ask you, is this part, your part of the commitment? And if you are willing at the end, I want you to say we do, but as a church, we promise to support and encourage and care for these children and their families by praying for them faithfully, by modeling our, by our lives what it means to be a Christ follower, by walking beside these families as these children grow in spiritual knowledge and understanding. And if you are willing to make those commitments, I want you to say together, we do. We do. We do. We, we mean that. And I want to pray over these families. And if you guys would just kind of reach your hands out there and as your way of saying, we're praying over you guys as well and these children. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for families. Thank you for the blessing of children. God, this is a difficult world to raise children in and, and these families are been given that responsibility by you. Ultimately, these are your children, God, and I just pray that they would take these vows seriously and I pray, God, that every single day of their lives that they would model their faith in Jesus to these children and even when they fail, when they make mistakes, that they would would, would explain that, that we're not perfect, that we're forgiven followers of Jesus and we do make mistakes, but we're, 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 we're wanting to commit our lives fully to, to the devotion to Christ. And I pray, God, that these children would one day grow up to an age where they have come to this point in their life when they're saying, I want to follow Jesus myself. I've seen it modeled by my parents. I've seen it modeled by my church family. And I want what they have. God, that is our prayer. 
You've got your hand on these children. We don't know what they're going to turn out to be. Maybe they'll be a president of the United States one day. Maybe they'll be a, 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 a homemaker. Maybe they'll be someone who's in the education system. Who knows what they'll be, but you know, God. And I pray over them, and I pray that you, your greatest blessing on these families, on these children. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. As they're making their way off and bringing their children back, let's give them a hand one more time. Thank you guys for what you're doing. We love you. We care about you guys. Thank you so much. And as they're going out, they're going to take their kids. We've got a little Bible to give to each of the children. And we're going to pray over them. We've got a song that Kevin's going to continue, what part what we sang. And this is the part as you think about what they're doing and what's happening here. This song is so appropriate. So Kevin, lead us. Yeah. Let's stand back up. Yeah, you can stand with us. You know, this, this song comes straight out of Scripture. It's a blessing. It was said over God's people. And it's for generation after generation after generation. And that means that it's, it's for us today as it was for them. When it talks about the Lord's blessing that he pours out, I love, I love that it, the, the line ends with that, may he give you peace. Because when we think of the Lord blessing us, our mind typically goes to, man, Lord, I want happiness. I want money, a lot of money. I want to be rich. And Lord, like, I want comfort. Like, those are the things we think of when we think of blessings. Like, what will, what will make us feel like, man, this, this life is... It's satisfying. It's giving me what I need. But if you've experienced some of those, they all end up running short and running dry. The thing about peace is that it is final in the moment. It's complete. If you think about it, if, if the Lord gives you riches, you just want more riches. If the Lord gives comfort, you might want more comfort. But when there's peace, it is a complete, a complete statement. It is a complete state of mind that only he can give. And so as we pray this blessing over, over our families that we, are, that we are committed to, I want you to receive this as a blessing over you as well, to sing this over your family, that he would pour his favor out. And the most important favor that he would give would be to give you peace today. And maybe you're here today, maybe you're like, man, I, I, I've heard of peace, but I've never experienced it for myself. I want to tell you, you're in the right place today. And maybe as this song singing, you just might just pray, God, would you just open my heart and show me if that peace that, that he's talking about is real? Would you show me if it's for me? So let's continue to worship. Let's 
and your family and your children and their children and their children and their children go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going
Believe it yet. Yeah, God, the only reason that those are powerful words is because you're a powerful God. Those words are true, and I just pray that they would be true in this house today, in our hearts today. Lord, if there's anyone in here who needs a way today, who's waiting on a promise that you've made today. Lord, would you show them you're moving here, you're working here, that, Lord, you're for them. Would you give them a fresh word today? Lord, we're so thankful for you, and we love you so much. It's in your name we pray, your powerful name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys can take a seat.
Man, I'll tell you, it has been a jam-packed morning already, jam-packed week, weekend here around Foothills, and we got more to come because, as you heard Pastor Jamie say, if you want to come to the next class, even this might be your first Sunday, and you're going, hey, what is next? It's your next step. You want to know how to get involved? You want to hear more about the church? Come after the 11 o'clock service, so somewhere around noonish or so, we're going to be serving lunch and child care and all that. But last night was amazing. Pastor Jamie mentioned that the kind of like everybody... The word that he used was joy. Everybody was so joyful coming through the lines, getting the, the drive through trick-or-treat or trunk-or-treat thing was amazing. And I'll tell you what, thank you to all of you who volunteered and did so many, hundreds of hours of time went into that. Thank you so much. And thousands of people came through driving. Very creative stuff. I got to say this, though. Um, joy might have been the word, but my wife... You know, everybody was decorating their vehicles. I didn't dress up, but she said, all right, you're going to dress up your vehicle. And I said, what am I going to do? She says, you're going to be the Grinch. Your vehicle's going to be the Grinch vehicle. So that's what I was. My vehicle was the Grinch vehicle. When everybody else is going through and the kids are all having fun, they get to my vehicle. Here's what I'm hearing. I hate the Grinch. I hate the Grinch. I'm like, why does she do this to me? Like every kid is like, I've got a complex now. Everybody hates me. No, but it's, it'll be okay. I've got some counseling scheduled. But anyways... Uh, but it was a great night. It was so good. And um, I'm just praying that many of those families who maybe uh, didn't even know we existed, maybe came through and said, check that church out. In fact, I had people tell me that. We're going to come to church. So that was really good. You know, they say the hindsight's 2020. Wouldn't it be good to be able to kind of, knowing what you know now, to go back and make some decisions that you, you know, at the time you thought they were good decisions, now you know they weren't such good decisions. Or maybe if something that you could go back and go, if I only had another chance to do that, that kind of that regret thing, and if I could go back, hindsight's 2020. 20, knowing what I know now, that would be awesome. For instance, let's just say when it comes to financial things, let's just say if you, in the beginning, when some of these companies that have become huge companies, if you could have got in on the ground floor of some of those companies and invested a little bit of money in, in Coca-Cola when it first came out or when they did first public offering of, of Netflix or Facebook, or Amazon, or Microsoft, these kind of companies, knowing what you know now, wouldn't you have done that, right? You'd have invested in those companies if you knew what that would have done. In fact, I hear, listen to some of this stuff because I, I went through and I, I looked at what some of these companies, what the return would have been had you invested money, had I invested money when they first had their public offering of, of stock. And if you took $1,000, think about this, Knowing what we know now, we'd do it. But if, back then, if we'd have known, in 2002, if you took $1,000 and would have invested in a company called Netflix, that $1,000 today, and since 2002, you would be worth $341,000. That's a 34,000% return on investment. Amazing. How about $1,000 of Microsoft stock when it came out in 1986? If you'd have done that, you know how much you'd have right now? That $1,000 would be $1.8 million. 211,000% return on investment. How about Coca-Cola? If you'd invested $1,000 in 1919 in Coca-Cola, you would that $1,000 would be worth $12,165,000. That's pretty good. If you would, in 1980, if you'd had $1,000 invest in a little company called Apple, that $1,000 today in 40 years would be worth $8,915,000. I don't know about you, but when I read those things, I go, man, I wish I would have done that. I wish somebody would have told me if I'd had somebody come up and said, oh, I wish you, you could have invested in my company way back when. All right, so with that as a backdrop, and, and hindsight being 2020, what if Bill Gates called you today on your cell phone? Somebody got your, he got your number somehow, called you on a cell phone. Hey, this is Bill Gates. Like, really, this is Bill Gates? Yeah, this is Bill Gates. And I want to let you know that I'm getting ready to start up this high-tech company, a new one, that only a few privileged people are going to be a part of. Would you be willing to invest money in my company? Well, how many of us would say, no, no, but no, we'd all go, tell me how much you need, Bill. I'll do whatever I need to do to get in on that thing. Well, that's essentially what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to get actually investment advice from somebody who actually knows the future. His name is Jesus. And he tells us how to invest our life, how to invest our resources, 
and how to invest our money for the greatest return on investment. We're in a series called Short Stories. In this series, it's a series on some of the parables of Jesus. Some of the parables, a parable, by the way, is just a story that Jesus would tell to illustrate a point. He would use these stories as kind of like, here, here, I've give you, here's what you need to know. Now let me give you a story to, to illustrate that. Some of them have been pretty easy to understand, some of the ones we've looked at. But i got to tell you, this is the one I was, I, I've always avoided teaching on this one. Because this is arguably the most difficult parable to decipher of any of the parables that Jesus taught. It's so hard to understand. Because when you read it initially, you're going to think, that doesn't sound right. And I want to get to it today. So if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 16. And again, a very difficult parable because um, on the surface, you're going to go, huh? How could that be? Luke chapter 16, this message, I'm calling it kingdom investing because, again, the parables was a way that Jesus would tell a story. It was really about the kingdom of God, how things were supposed to operate in God's economy and the way that God sees it. We have, you know, this kind of this world that that everybody kind of knows how this world works because we're part of it. But Jesus would come around and go, okay, that's how the world does it. But as followers of mine, we're going to do it a different way. It's the kingdom way of doing things. And it's going to be completely different. And it's going to be a whole lot more difficult. But that's the way you need to do things. And so when it comes to investing, kingdom investing, it's the same way. So in chapter 16, beginning in verse 1, it says, Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, What's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you are going to be fired. You're fired. The manager thought to himself, Now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill quick and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him a thousand bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are children of the light. Here's the lesson. Here it is. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends. And then when your earthly possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. If you are faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who dearly loved their money, heard all this and scoffed at him. Then he said to them, You like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. Again, this is a tricky one to kind of wade through, but we're going to do that today. And and again, I'm calling this kingdom investing because really this is what Jesus is talking about, is learning how to invest in the right things with our time, our resources, our our money, and our lives. How do we do this? And and, and what are the right things? And so Jesus kind of paints the picture for us. And I want to give you kind of a a why, and then I want to give you a the what, okay? So there's a why to why we do this, and then there's a what. What what you know what what do we do? So so let me give you the first point here. And this is what we learned from this parable, and that is this investing into people and their eternities gives the best return on investment. Say it again. Investing into people and their eternities gives the best return on investment. Now, return on investment, or ROI, is a financial term that you're probably familiar with. 
And here's what it actually means. It means it's a measure of profitability that indicates whether or not a company is using its resources in an effective manner. So it's, it, if you look at some of the companies that I mentioned a minute ago, when you're seeing Netflix, which had a 34,000% return on investment, you would have to say, that company has doing well managing their company for profit, right? Or if you had invested into Microsoft, which had a 211,000% return on investment, you would have to say, they know what they're doing. They kind of got it figured out. And that would be a, a measure of profitability. And their investors, if you were one of their investors, you are happy that they are giving you a good return on investment. And Jesus said, look, there are things that are more important. Basically, he's saying, here, look, if you want to know what's really important and how to invest everything that you have, your life, your energy, your resources, your finances, your time, here's what you do. You take that and you change your mindset to a kingdom mindset. And what you're going to do is you're going to invest not in the things of this world. Now, there's nothing wrong with those kind of investments. But where your energy needs to be and where your money really needs to be are things that have eternal consequences. Basically, Jesus is saying, let, let me give you a hot tip how to, how to invest. Invest into people and into eternal things. That's what really matters. That is what will last. Everything else fades away. Everything doesn't last. But that will mass. Now, last. So when we look at the context of the story, and this is what makes it difficult, and this is why I think most people under, misunderstand this story, because we're, we're, we're kind of reading into it something that, that I don't think is meant to be read into. So the story is basically this. You've got this owner of this company, and he's got a manager. And this manager has been cooking the books, apparently. He's not being really good at what he does. He's been dishonest or just not keeping things up to date, whatever it is, but he's, 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 he's falling short. So the owner of the company comes, brings in the manager, says, look, look, we need to have a little conversation. They have a little conversation. He goes, here's your pink slip. I can't use you anymore. And he doesn't fire him on the spot. He doesn't say, look, we're going to clean out your desk and we're going to escort you out. He says, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to fire you. But apparently he gives him a little time. He probably says, look, by the end of the week, you're going to have to find a new job. So he gives him a little grace. says, you know, you're, you're, but you're done here. You, you're, you, know, you haven't done a good job. So the manager just says, okay, what am I going to do? I got, I got to the end of the week. I better do something. So he says, I know what I'll do. Well, if, at first he's kind of in his mind going, okay, I'm not going to have a job. What should I do? Well, uh, he says, I'm too old to dig ditches. I, I'm too old to do manual labor. You know, I'm, I'm beyond that. I, I, don't, I don't have what it takes there. I'm not gonna, I'm not, that's not a future for me. Then he says, I'm too proud to beg. I'm, I can go on a street corner and, and try to beg. That's not going to work. I hold up a sign. You know, we'll work for food. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Let's be honest, it's a little undignified for me. So, so what am I going to do? And he has this brilliant plan. He goes, I know what I'll do. So he calls in some of the people who owe his, who's, who's boss, the owner, the money. And he says to the first guy, he says, how much does he owe you? How much do you owe him? And he says, well, I own 800 gallons of olive oil, which was a big deal back then. Olive oil was very important. And the guy says, says okay, I'll tell you what, cut it in half. You get 400, 400 uh, you just pay 400 gallons back. The guy's like, are you kidding? Nah, it's okay. It's on, it's on me today, brother. I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut you a deal. Just remember me later. That's basically what he's like. Just remember me later. Cuts him a deal. Then he goes to the next guy and says, how much do you owe? thousand bushels of wheat. Make it 800. Just remember me. I'm the one that's doing this for you. And he does it. And then it says this, that the manager actually is going, that's pretty slick. I mean, the owner says, that's pretty slick. That's, that's not bad thinking. And here's, here's what he said. It says this in, in verse 8. It says, the rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of the world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are children of the light. Here's the lesson. All right? So, so let me stop there for a second. This is the part that's so confusing. If this is a parable that Jesus is teaching, why does he almost seem like he's applauding or commending this dishonesty? Because that's pretty dishonest. Wouldn't you agree? Like, this guy is cutting deals behind his owner's back. Hasn't been given permission to do it, but he's doing it. He's negotiating these deals on his own. But instead of the owner going, who do you think you are cutting these deals? The owner goes, that's pretty slick, dude. That's awesome. That's pretty good. And Jesus basically says, he has to say, he had to admire the dishonest, shrewdness of this dishonest guy. So is Jesus then commanding dishonesty in order to get what you want? No, this is where, this is where it's confusing, and this is why you need the explanation. Here's what you need to understand. A parable was a teaching tool. Some, 
The point is really what you look at, not the story itself. See, if you get caught up in just the story, then you start portraying that story as what he was, that, that's the meaning. No, Jesus is using the story to, for a greater point. And he's about to tell us what the point is. He says, okay, that's the story. And then he says, it's, it's, it's true that, that the children of the world are more shrewd than, are dealing with the world around them than the children of light. And he says, here's the lesson. Here's what you need to know. Forget the story for a second. But here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends. Um, then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you into you, to an eternal home. All right, so what does he mean by that? Well, he's saying this. He's saying, look, in the big scheme of things, there are things that are temporal and there are things that are eternal. And, and, and he says the kingdom, the, the children of this world, I'm going to explain that more in a second point, but the children of the world are a little more shrewd than children of light, you know, than, than followers of Jesus. And they're not, they don't have street smarts. And they need to have some street smarts here because there's some things here that they need to leverage and they're not doing a very good job of it. And he says, look, here's what you need to understand. Here's the moral of the story. Is that you need to do kind of like what this guy did with not the dishonest part, but you need to be thinking ahead. You need to look at what's really important with your investing of everything that you have. And the only thing that will last are the eternal things. So what you need to do is just what this guy did. He looked ahead and he said, I know I got trouble on the horizon. I need to be, I need to set some things up because later I'm going to be homeless and without a job. And I need to have some friends there who are going to help me um, get by later. And so he, he, he's referring to these eternal things. So, so here's how it translates. Is that every time that I invest my time, my energy, my life, and my finances into things that have eternal impact, which are people's lives for eternity, that's the best return on investment. Because no matter what happens in the economy, financially, that will live on forever. So that, when, what, we, what we have to look at this is think about your own life. How are you investing into people? I know for me, let me give you an example of how this works. So my mentor, when I gave my life to Jesus, I kind of floundered for about a year because I, didn't have, I didn't, wasn't being discipled. And my, my pastor came, um, Pastor Ron Lentini, and he came to me and he said, I want to invest in you. I want, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of, basically, he didn't say this, but he took me under his wing along with a lot of other people over the years. But he took me under his wing. He taught me how to share my faith. He taught me about Jesus. He discipled me and he gave me opportunities that he probably, you know, was, were, were risky. He gave me these opportunities to stand up and proclaim the gospel and things like this. And it was an investment into me. And, and, and what I've been trying to do ever since then is I want, I want to kind of pay it forward. I want to invest in other people and their eternities. I want, I want others to one day, when I get to heaven, there's going to be people there who go, thank you for what you did. Thank you for what you did because of what you did helped me to end up here as well. My wife is... is I, I was talking to our staff the other day about influence, how all of us have influence. And it doesn't matter who, who you are, you have influence. And influence, a lot of times we take it very lightly. We don't really understand the, 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 the uh, power of influence. And I, and I, and I was using an example of when using our influence for e basically eternal things. When you're pouring into other people, that's, that's, a great, that's a great way to use the influence. And I was thinking about my wife, and I said, you know, when it comes to heaven, one day when, when, when people are in heaven... And people are like standing in line, if, if this is the way it works, I don't know if it will, but people are standing in line thanking others for their investment into them as they get into heaven. As they're, you know, my wife, I think, is going to have a line that's going to be miles long. I mean, there are going to be so many people that says, they're going to say, thank you, Liz, for your investment in me. Thank you for caring about me. Thank you for your sacrifice for me. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm gonna, I, I, maybe I'll have a couple people there, but she's going to have like a mile-long line. And they're going to be saying, thank you, because she invests in people. She cares about people. She loves people. And I'm going to tell you something. That's what it's all about. That's what Jesus is saying. It's that one day, this life, this earthly life can be over. And really what's going to matter in a big kingdom kind of thing, the economy of God's economy, is the influence you had on people's lives. Particularly the, the gospel-centered relationships that you've built. Because that's really what it's about. It's not just about, hey, I've got a bunch of buddies. 
is that my, my, my relationships are strategic. They're gospel-centered relationships where we're pouring into one another. We're iron sharpening iron. I'm leading people to Jesus. I'm telling others about Christ because that's what the investment's all about. It's not about this dishonest guy. That's just the story. The point that Jesus is making, look, you need to invest in the things that are going to last. That's the only thing that's going to matter, and that's the best return on investment with your, of everything that you have. But it is, it is a statement of finances, and that's the other part of the story is that it's not just about me building relationships with other people. It's about how I spend my money. This is really what it's about. Because remember at the end of the story, it says that there were some Pharisees who overheard this story. Because Jesus is telling the story to his disciples, but he's telling it in earshot of the Pharisees, that the scripture says, who loved their money. They're all about the money. And so the Pharisees are hearing Jesus and they scoffed at what he said. That's what, a, a scoffing is a term of like, you, that's ridiculous. <laughs> scoff. <laughs> I guess that's, scoff. that's my imitation of a scoff. Scoff. Anyway, so he's, they're scoffing at him and they're going, that doesn't make sense. And they, these were religious leaders, Jewish religious leaders, who should have been thinking about kingdom, but they were thinking about temporal things, the things of the world. And Jesus tells a story. It steps on their toes a little bit. And so they don't like it. They scoff at him. And they scoff. And he's like, hey, check this out. He's telling basically his disciples. That's the problem. Right there. In a nutshell, those guys are, are, are only thinking about what's happening in the world. And they're not thinking about eternity. That's the story. That's the moral of the story. Now, that's, that's the kind of the, the, the what, but, but what about the why, right? What, why? What, you know, why do we do this? That's the what. What's the, what's the why? What's the purpose of this? Well, that's the second point, and it's this. As children of light, we're to be good managers of our master's resources. That's, that's the why is that all the resources that we're investing, this kingdom investing, are not ours. That's the why, because it's not ours to begin with. They're the managers. They're the owners. We're, we're the managers. They're the owners' stuff. And that's how it lives in our life. So the next week, give me an example. Next week, we've got baptisms. Every person who steps forward and is baptized next week, guess what? Every person who is given toward whatever goes into that that general part of the budget that goes to reaching people for Jesus. So every person who's baptized next week, if you've given, you're a part of that. You've invested in that person, whether you realize it or not. That's your investment. That's the point. So the, the why is that as children of light, children of light and children of the world. Okay, the children of the world that he's speaking of are those who don't know Christ. Children of light are people who are followers of Jesus. That's, that's the terminology, okay? So as children of light, we're to be good managers of our master's resource. Who's the master? Jesus. Do we own anything? No, we're managers. He's the owner. That's the point. That's, that's the why. It's not ours to begin with. It's like, I don't have that. I don't, technically, if a follower of Jesus, I don't even have the right to just go around and, and do what I want to do whenever I feel like doing it. I don't even have that right. Because I no longer, I've been bought with a price. That's what the Bible says. I'm not my own. Because of Jesus dying on a cross and shedding his blood, I've been bought with a price. You've been bought with a price if you're a follower of Jesus. You're now a children, child of light. And we need to live that way. We need to think kingdom and not world. And that's a hard thing to do because we live in this world. But this is temporal, and that's long-term, the kingdom. So stewards, this is the word for manager. You've probably heard that if you've been around church for a while. God owns everything. We only manage it. Everything. You can go down the list of what you have, and you don't own it. I know you think you own it, and you might even have a title that says you own it, but you don't own it. If you're a child of light, you don't own it. Everybody, and I know that's, you know, when you say that, it's almost like there's a pushback. Like there's a pushback because, like, wait a second. I do own it. I went out and worked, you know, put in my sweat and, 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 and put in my money, and I, and I earned it, and I worked it, and this is mine, and it's, no, you don't own it. See, if you're a child of light, this, you relinquish ownership of everything. You don't have anything, but that's actually a good thing if you think about it. I only manage God's resources. He owns it. So I can say this. If my transmission goes out of my car, guess what? It, it ain't my problem. It's God's because I only manage it. That's God. What are you going to do? 
Like some, this past week when all of those storms came through, a lot of people had trees fall in the houses. If you own the house, that's a problem. But if you, if you only rent that house, it's the owner's problem, right? Right? You call them up, say, hey, you got a problem. You got a roof. You got a, a tree on your roof here. And, and, and he's got to have it. That's what I'm saying. So it's a good thing. When you release control of anything and you realize, God, I don't own anything. That's good. But it, guess what? It carries a lot of responsibility. Because in the story, what you see is this guy was not managing well. He wasn't managing well. So I got to learn to manage well. I got to take God's resources and, and, and manage well. And Jesus says, hey, look, if you take my resources, the money you have in the bank, that's mine. Your title on your car, that's mine. Your children, those are mine. Your body, that's mine too. Like everything? Yeah, everything. All right? So what we have to do then is that Jesus said, this is mine. So here's what you need to do. You need to do it my way. And I want a good return on my investment. You remember the story um, that Jesus told one time about the parable? It's called the parable of talents. Now, talents is just a, 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 a type of money. Don't, don't think of talents like abilities. Talents is just is a, is a, a type of money. Like it could be a penny or a quarter or a dollar. A talent. So he tells this story. That was a different parable. He says, it's the parable of the talents. He says, this guy gives, uh, the owner gives his manager some stuff. He says, he gives one, one talent. He gives one five talents, uh, two talents, and one gives one five talents. And he says, then, he, then the owner leaves and comes back later and he says, okay, I want my money. What'd you do with it? And the, the one with um, five says, I invested it. And I, I invested it well. I, a return on investment. And I, here, here's 10. I, I doubled your money. And the, the owner said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Then he goes to the one with two. He said, how'd you do with my money? He goes, I doubled it, invested it. Awesome. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Goes to the one with one. What'd you do with it? I, I want my money. He goes, here's your one. He goes, I, I gave you one. That's all you got? Yeah, I, I, I knew that you were a tough man, so I buried it. I didn't lose anything. I just didn't invest it. And he took it, thinking that the guy would be happy. The guy was angry. The owner was angry. And, uh, and, and he had him, you know, kind of thrown in jail and all that. It, it was a bad situation. And the point of that parable was, hey, look, when God gives you something, you have a responsibility to be faithful. Because that's what he said. Good and faithful servants. You want to know the, the, what Jesus is looking for when it comes to return on investment? He wants your faithfulness. He's not interested in the amounts. He wants you to be faithful with what he gives him. So you might not have a lot. But God's saying, be faithful in what I give you. You're my manager. I own it. So you got to trust me here and just do what I need you to do and invest it well. And so when your life, you invest it in other people's life, your money, you invest it in other people's eternities, that's what you do. That's what he's saying. And that's the why behind it because we don't own it. He does. So go back to the parable and here's what it says. He says, Jesus kind of sums it up. If you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the others. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God uh, and, and be enslaved to money. You just can't do it. You can't. It, it is, you got, you got to kind of draw a line in the sand and say, who am I going to serve? And that's what Jesus is saying. So he says, if you're faithful in the little things, you're going to be faithful in the large things. That's, that's the measure of a good steward is faithfulness. That's, that's a good and faithful servant. That's what it, So the measure that Jesus will, will judge us on is our faithfulness with the, what he's given us. Not on what he's given the next person. That's up to them. It's, it's what he's given me. Am I faithful with what, what he's given me? Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to matter. He says, if you can't be trusted, if you're unfaithful to little stuff, you're not going to get more stuff. This is a biblical principle. You need to understand this. This is a biblical principle. If you are unfaithful with what you currently have, God is not going to give you any more because he can't trust you with it. And you can go down the list of what that means. Whatever That, that could be money. That could be possessions. That could be whatever. If you're not faithful as a child of light, not as a child of the world, if you're not faithful with what God has given you, he's not going to give you more. You can't be entrusted with more. You just can't. I have people all the time go, you know, I just, I need that promotion at work. I, I, I need that promotion at work. 
But why would God do that if you're not being faithful with where you are right now? If you're not giving your best at your work, when that promotion comes up, why would, any, why would God give you that? People say, I, I, I just, I need more money. I need more money. And God's like, wait a second. Look at, your, look at the disaster you're doing with your finances right now. Why am I going to give you more? So you can blow it? That doesn't make sense, does it? You wouldn't give somebody more if they were not taking care of what you... If you gave me your car and said, look, I want, you can borrow my car, and I, and I trashed it, you would be upset with me. You wouldn't go, hey, here, here take my truck too. You wouldn't do that. You would go, wait a second. I'd let you, you're borrowing this and you bring it back like this? Are you kidding me? There are pastors all the time go, I want a larger church, but they're not caring for the people that they have. Why would God do that? That's a biblical principle. So if I'm looking for more... Again, I don't, that's not my motivation, but if I expect God to give me more responsibility, more influence, more money, more whatever, I've got to be faithful where I'm at now so that God can say, okay, you passed the test, let me give you a little bit more. The biggest disservice God could give us is if we're not doing things well with what we've got to give us more. That would be terrible because we wouldn't... Why would you do that? It doesn't make sense. But yet a lot of people just continue to come back and go, why well, come God isn't blessing me? Because you're not being faithful. Because you're not being faithful. So this is what works out. So he says, no one can serve two masters. You can't serve both God and money. You gotta, again, you've got you to draw this line in the sand and go, where am I? Where am I? You know, whose side am I on here? Eternal versus temporal. Eternal lasts forever. Right? That's what eternal means. It lasts forever. Temporal is gone. Children of the world, and this again is what he said, the children of the world are more shrewd. They understand what's going on. And that's why the people who don't know Christ, they can work the system. They know how to do it because they are survivors. Children of light, he says, they're dumb. They're not very shrewd. They don't have street smarts. The children of the world are showing them up when it comes to the, you got to have that same mentality when it comes to kingdom stuff. That's how you got to do this. You got to think the way they think, but put it toward kingdom. You got to have that same tenacity that they have toward the things of the world or the things of the kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying. Yet most of us, if you put us in line and, and just all of us, me included, just put us in a line and you had, and nobody knew, right? Just had some random people. And let's just say we had, we had people who weren't followers of Jesus and people who were followers of Jesus, and they followed us around for a week or two. And um, these, these, these observers followed us around for a couple of weeks, and they lined us all across there. And, and we were to ask them, all right, which one is the follower of Jesus out of all this group? And we've got some mixed in that are not and some that are, but they've been following all of us around. Probably, for most of us, they probably, other than the fact we maybe we go to church, they probably, I really can't tell which one's which. And that's, that's kind of really a bad situation. But yet... That's probably the case, if we're honest. What we need to do is, if, if we were to look at our checkbooks, our bank accounts, however you do your finances these days, and we were to look at how we spend, me included, this is very telling, but where do, where do my resources go? I mean, we all have bills, we have things like that, but, but the, the other stuff, like beyond my necessities, where, where is my heart? Because that's, that's why Jesus would talk about money a lot. Because he says, that's where your treasure is. That's where your heart is. Where are we? So here, here's, the, here's the thing. As, as we close. All right. Think in the terms of, of, again, let's just draw a line. One side is temporal things. Things that are not going to last. One side is eternal things. Things that will last forever. How are we doing when it comes to investing? Our lives, our resources, our money, our time, our energy, our passions. Where do we sit on this kind of this continuum? Second question, um, for those who don't know Christ. If you don't know Jesus and you're trying to figure it all out, let me just, t let me just help you out right here. There, there, there's, the way that the world does it can look extremely attractive because that's all you know. But let me just tell you something. When you do the things in God's economy and live for the kingdom, your life will never, it can never get better than doing things for the kingdom versus things of the world. No matter what the world tells you, no matter how, how 
um, enticing the things of the world are. When you invest, truly invest in the things of God and give your life to Jesus, your life takes on a new dynamic. You have a different lens that you see the world through. And it will change everything about you. And so if you don't know Christ, let me just encourage you today. Give your heart and your life to him. Quit trying to do it on your own. Because you're going to end up at the end. You talk about hindsight being 20-20. You're going to end up at the end of your life. And if you don't have Jesus in your life, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to have a lot of regrets. You're going to go, man, why didn't I do this sooner? Why didn't I give my life to Jesus when I still had energy, when I still had resources, when I still had some living to do? Why didn't I do that? Why did I wait? If you have that luxury of being on a deathbed, having that thought. So let's pray and let's ask God to really dig this one down deep in our hearts and, and really ask myself, where am I invested? God, thank you for the challenge of the word of God. Every time we open our Bible, it speaks to us, and sometimes it screams at us, and sometimes it whispers to us, but it always gets our attention because it tells us that there are things that we need to tweak and change and, and, uh, and new ways to think and operate. And this is a big one for most of us because we've never really, we've never really done this very well. At least I haven't. So I pray, God, that you today would change our hearts and you would show us in a very real way where we're spending, where we're spending our time and energy and resources and, and so that we can have the shrewdness of the guy in the story to say, you know what, there's an eternity coming. One day, life as I know is going to end and what's going to matter is what I've done toward the eternal things and show us that now because... We don't want to live with regrets. So, God, I pray also for those who don't know Jesus Christ personally, that today would be the day they say yes, because you've been seeking after them and pursuing them all of their lives, and today could be their day. So if, if that's you today, and you're saying, I'm going to give my heart and my life to Jesus today, I want to change from the inside out, and I can't do it on my own, and I'm trusting in what Jesus did on that cross, and if that's you and you'd like to invite Christ to be your Lord and Savior, maybe a prayer like this, say, Jesus, today I give you my life. Thank you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross. I invite you to be my Lord and Savior today. God, you are incredibly awesome. We love you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you gave your life to Jesus, we want to know about it. And a couple ways you can let us know on your online connection card, you can do it that way. You can stop by the Connection Center or you can text it to 97342. I do this every week. 973-4221. I hope that's right. If not, somebody's going to get a, a random text. But that's what we're going to do. Hey, if you're a guest, I'd love to meet you. Don't forget about the next class. Guys, I love you. I, I, I pray that you have an amazing day. If you need prayer or you need to talk to somebody, Pastor Blaine will be up here right after the service. Guys, have an amazing week. Stay safe. I love you guys.